In recent years, a peculiar trend has arisen among the extreme woke elements on the far left. To ignore the reality of biological gender by creating nonsensical categories and then attempting to cow everyone else to accept and accommodate them. Listen, Eric, you must know why we can't have you in the girls' bathroom. All I know is I'm transgender and you can't make me go to the bathroom with the cisgenders. With the what? Cisgender. It's the politically correct name for people who aren't transgender. If you identify with the sex you were born with, then you're cis. But then cisgender is just normal. Saying normal is extremely offensive to people who aren't in that group. Trust me, you don't want this hot potato. Just let him use the girls' room. This trend has been criticized by center-right and center-left alike, even being mocked by some. Women have come a long way, baby, and the vast majority of that has been long overdue and very, very positive. But maybe in this one way, you're a victim of your own success. You can win the battle and lose the war if you harangue men into becoming less like us and more like you and end up with someone you have absolutely no desire to fuck. And that's not good for either of the 71 genders we now have. Maybe what we need these days is more sex and less gender. As pointed out in his What is a Woman documentary, Matt Walsh notes that transgender ideology renders the concept of biological sex incoherent. But if sex is incoherent, then so too is gender ideology, and the idea that sex can be changed. So what is at issue is not the idea that people can really be the opposite sex, as this proves incoherent. Rather, what is really being said is that sex and gender should not be normative categories around which society ought to frame itself. The trouble is that there is currently not a strong rationale to the contrary. Obviously, the consequences of such an ideology are obnoxious, but that is not an argument in itself. Gender ideology produces many excesses such as biological men going in the women's bathroom or competing in women's sports. But these are externalities, albeit socially disruptive ones, rather than intrinsic reasons in themselves. Where, then, are the norms to the contrary derived other than common sense? In my previous video, I described the differences between the twin pillars of Western civilization, constituting Athens and Jerusalem, namely our intellectual tradition and our religious one. If we look to Athens, we are told that biological sex is merely an accident of evolution, arriving with the advent of meiosis among single-celled organisms. Though important in refreshing genetic material, this does not provide a normative dimension to gender. Similarly, Mr. Broflovsky can surgically change himself into a dolphin, but nothing about mammal phylogeny tells us why getting dolphinoplasties should not be normalized. This leaves the pillar of Jerusalem. The institution of religion can provide a variety of prohibitions that could relate to this. However, when asked for reasons behind these prohibitions, it is lacking in an underlying rationale. Merely saying that it is because God said so, or citing a religious text, does not count as a rationale. In the modern world, we insist on reasons for things. However, blind assertions of dogma are not the same thing as reasons. To the modern mind, this sort of thinking is not even wrong. But is it really the case that religion does not provide a rationale for its norms related to the genders and their relationship to each other? The traditional line given as a philosophic rationale for religious views on sex and gender is often provided by natural law theory, the idea that teleology somehow determines morality. But this presupposes a whole chain of things, that teleology exists in the first place, that function is determined by teleology, and that teleology somehow relates to normative value. Each of these assumptions are tenuous and difficult to prove in their own right, and if any one of them goes, the whole argument goes like a house of cards. Worse yet, if the same logic is applied elsewhere, it quickly leads to a series of obvious absurdities. DNA computery the crime against nature of using DNA for computation, contrary to its natural end of transcription. Vacuum leaf blowery, the crime against nature of reversing the motor of a vacuum cleaner to turn it into a leaf blower, contrary to its natural end as a suction machine. Nose printer papery, the crime against nature of stuffing printer paper up one's nose, contrary to its natural end of breathing. Very quickly, it becomes obvious that this theory does not work, and is being used in a selective manner to rationalize already predetermined religious beliefs, 
rather than being a solid basis for norms. But is this really all there is? As it turns out, this is not the original reason given by religion itself. The real reason given defines the origin of gender as a normative concept, as well as the norms given by religion around it. This shows up in an obscure passage in the book of Genesis, which directly follows Eve being created from Adam's rib. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Here the genders and their relations are defined in terms of their joint cosmogonic origin. They started as one joint being, and from there split into two genders, only to be merged back together again in marriage. Of course, the only trouble is that from the outside of religion, the Adam and Eve account is indistinguishable from mythology. Worse yet, with or without mythology, modern genetics shows us that this is not the origin of human gender anyway. Genetic studies indicate that our species' lowest genetic bottleneck was the Toba catastrophe, which left between 1,000 to 10,000 breeding pairs, rather than just one. Thus the religious concept of gender, from which Western cultural norms were derived for centuries, seems to have dissolved away. Or has it? Is this particular detail of the story perhaps a metaphor for something else? Something much more literal? The story of Eve as Adam's rib could be dismissed as mythology. However, there is a specific underlying pattern in this story that curiously shows up independently in every major religion across the planet, as well as in various now extinct religions. In addition to the Genesis narrative found in Judaism and Christianity, the same pattern is found in Islam in the Sufi sect. It says, Out of the original unity of being, there is fragmentation and dispersal of beings, the last stage being the splitting of one soul into two, and consequently, love is the search by the other half for the other half on earth or in heaven. This is not contained to the Abrahamic religions either. The pattern is found to repeat itself in the East as well. For example, in Buddhism, there are a pair of bodhisattvas called Tara and Avalokitesvara, who are the female and male counterparts to each other. According to Buddhist legend, Tara sprang from a tear of Avalokitesvara after it was dropped into a lake. Once again we see the same theme of joint ontological origin as in the Adam and Eve story as well as the feminine principle originating from the masculine principle, also as seen in the Adam and Eve story. Likewise, when we examine Hinduism, the god and goddess pair Shiva and Shakti represent male and female principles. They are counterparts to one another that are seen as actually being the male and female aspects of the androgynous Ardhana Rajvara, which is considered to be the union of the two. Extinct religions are seen as repeating this same pattern as well. Take for example the story of Isis and Osiris in ancient Egyptian religion. The two are seen as being both husband and wife, but also brother and sister. This is not meant to signify divine incest, but rather is indicative of sharing a joint cosmogonic origin from an original whole. It even shows up in the oldest religion in history, that of the ancient Sumerians. According to Sumerian creation myths, the world was created from a primordial mountain called Anki, Anki then split apart into the masculine An meaning heaven, and the feminine Ki meaning earth. Again, the joint origin of the genders from an original state of unity shows up. Curiously, this pattern even dates into prehistory, and is found in the triptych temple phenomenon. In recent times, a curious pattern has been discovered wherein ancient temples from all over the world are found to display the same specific architectural design. Temples from locations as diverse as Mexico, Egypt, Indonesia, and India all display a pattern known as the triptych, wherein a central larger door is flanked by a pair of smaller doors on either side. Little is known about the origins of the triptych design, other than that the cultural influence behind it must have been global owing to its global distribution, and that it must have predated the arrival of the Amerindian cultures to the Americas, owing to its appearance in Mayan temples found in southern Mexico. This necessarily places it into prehistory before the earliest written records. As such, we may not have discovered its symbolic significance, were it not for a lucky historical accident. Curiously, the triptych was found in more recent architecture as well, on the facades of Gothic cathedrals constructed during the Middle Ages. An examination of their construction reveals that they were built by guilds of Freemasons, 
prior to the falling out between the Masons and the Catholic Church in the 17th century. An examination of the Masonic tracing board reveals the meaning of the symbolism behind it. The symbols of the sun and moon over the twin pillars on either side are medieval alchemical symbolism for the masculine and feminine principles, whereas the all-seeing eye in the center represents God as well as the previous state of unity of the two. As it turns out, this is what the triptych design in these cathedrals was based on. As Masonic author Walter Wilmshurst noted, The pillars have been incorporated into Christian architecture. If you recall the construction of Yorkminster or Westminster Abbey, you will recognize the pillars in the two great towers flanking the main entrance. The central arch here refers to a state of prayer unity in God, whereas the side arches represent the male and female pillars. Thus the same pattern shows up encoded in the triptych design. Once again, male and female are represented as deriving from a state of prayer unity. This pattern is known as the androgyne, and it shows up in every major religion, extinct religions, and even into prehistory. But where does it come from? So far, the androgyne appears as a mysterious artifact, missing a context or explanation. If we dig a little deeper, however, we discover the androgyne's missing context. For this, we need to look at yet another of its instantiations, this time not in a religion, but in an ancient esoteric metaphysical system known as Hermeticism. Hermeticism derives the androgyne concept from its idealistic metaphysics, in its principle of mental gender. Here God is described as the All, with the universe being seen as a kind of dream within the divine mind. God, however, is seen as the initiator of creation and thus as masculine. The contents of the mind of the All are the created and thus the recipients of God's act of creation, and are thus seen as feminine. Masculine and feminine principles are seen in terms of initiative and receptive forces, which then filter down into creation. What we see then as male and female in the biological sense are actually just the physical representations or symbols corresponding to these underlying forces. One might be tempted to suggest that this is merely more post hoc metaphysical rationalization for predetermined religious views. However, this is not the case. In one instance of the androgyne, it becomes quite clear that instead of being a rationalization for religion, religion is in fact referencing the same picture. As it turns out, the androgyne actually shows up twice in the Bible. In addition to the Genesis narrative, it shows up again in the Christian New Testament, in the book of Colossians. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. Here creation is literally described as being both created and held together within Christ. However, this is immediately juxtaposed with the relationship between Christ and the Church, the symbolic feminine bride and masculine groom in Paul's writings. Christ being God is the masculine groom. The Church being part of God's internal and thus mental creation is the feminine bride. Here we see a precise replica of the principle of mental gender referred to in Hermeticism. The two are referring to the same thing, only using different language. Rather than being a post hoc rationalization for religion, it turns out that this is what religion is talking about to begin with. But is there any reason to believe this? It is true that one could reject any of the individual narrative accounts provided by any and or all of the aforementioned religions, as merely being mythology and still hold to the androgyne concept on metaphysical grounds. However, could it be argued that we have simply replaced mythological nonsense with metaphysical nonsense? Is there any reason to believe the account provided by hermetic metaphysics? any more than any of the corresponding accounts provided by comparative religion? Or is this just metaphysical nonsense? As it turns out, it may not just be metaphysical nonsense. In a 2018 book, authors Olivia and Ethan Palmer argue that the system of hermetic metaphysics can be derived in its entirety from physics-based idealism. At first, when this was being promoted on the idealism board, I feared that this was simply New Age fluff. When I finally got around to looking at it, it turned out, much to my surprise, that I was wrong. Their book, The Quantum Hermetica, sports a whopping 172 scientific references, for its short length of a mere 94 pages. Instead of Wu, what was argued was that hermetic metaphysics could be neatly derived from any number of models commonly associated with quantum idealism, the most famous example of which being Hoffman's conscious realism. Of course, such models could always be wrong, 
but the equivalence that the authors drew between them and Hermetic metaphysics was precise. If this is the case, then it allows one to think of these concepts found in religion in a completely different manner than we are accustomed to. Though these models overlap metaphysics and physics, here I will be looking at the metaphysical set of these parallels. In a previous video, I explored the physics parallels the authors raised. However, if you saw that video, you will recall that the physics parallels posited by the authors entail controversial implications. Hence my disclaimer at the beginning of that video regarding the subject matter. The link to that video, as well as to the book, are in the description below. The science behind the purely metaphysical aspect, though, is basic enough, and should not be that controversial. The case being made is that physical realism is false. Namely, what the science shows is that what we perceive as space and the matter in it do not actually exist beyond our perceptions, and a great many articles and videos have been published exploring this topic elsewhere. Donald Hoffman argues from this that there is an objective reality behind our perceptions that obeys scientific laws, but that that reality is not a physical one. Rather, he argues that what we perceive as physical objects are actually just icon interfaces corresponding to a world of non-spatial and immaterial conscious agents behind them. The world consists of conscious agents, so what, what you see is not space and time and physical stuff, it's other conscious agents, and your interface is just presenting you that interaction in space as a space-time desktop. A physical body, then, is not a fundamentally real thing in itself, but rather exists only in our perception of it being the representation of conscious agents, which Hoffman identifies with wave functions existing behind our perceptions. Keep this in mind, because this detail will become important a little later. But now, is there anything analogous to the androgyne or Hermeticism's principle of gender in this? Sort of. The Hermetic concept of gender does not directly follow from the theory. However, there is something in it that directly entails the one becoming two concept found in the androgyne, the combination theorem. So you can actually have conscious agents, they're, they're linked in a network like this. Um, you can do it more abstractly, a graphical symbol like that, where effectively one is sending information to the other and receiving information. They're, they're, so information is flowing between the two. Um, you can have three conscious agents linked together um, or linked like that. You can have four. And in fact, if you think about it, you can have any number of conscious agents linked together in a network and have now you have a, a very interesting dynamical systems thing. Uh, you can have introspection. It turns out if you have two conscious agents, the, the mathematics surprised me, it turns out two conscious agents interacting satisfy the definition of one conscious agent. They are also one conscious agent that's introspecting. So what comes out of this mathematics is a model of introspection that's completely rigorous. You can have, so now more abstractly, each dot is a conscious agent, each link is a connection between conscious agents where they're communicating with each other. You can have arbitrary graphs of conscious agents, and it turns out to be a theorem that given any graph of conscious agents, any subset of the conscious agents constitute a new single conscious agent. According to Hoffman's model, as well as other quantum idealist approaches, a pair of conscious agents can themselves comprise a single larger conscious agent. This result, known as the combination theorem, can account for the individuation of consciousness in an idealist universe. Looking at this upside down, though, we end up with a single conscious agent existing at some higher reference frame, and then splitting into two separate conscious agents. This picture looks remarkably like the androgyne, minus the reference to gender. With a little metaphysical extrapolation, it is not difficult to see how the androgyne could be replicated, however. Masculine and feminine are associated with conscious intentions here, namely the desires to initiate and receive. Given that all types of desires fall into one of these two categories, when a conscious agent having them splits, each of the subsequent agents will end up likely possessing more of one of them than the other, and vice versa. When examining statistics regarding dating, this is pretty straightforward. The man usually expresses a desire to initiate the date, whereas the woman usually expresses a desire to be asked out on the date. And on Hoffman's model, such differing conscious states have differing icon interfaces. The male plug, for instance, initiates, whereas the female socket receives. Likewise, the male sperm initiates, and the female egg receives. See it now? 
Male or female biological sexes, then, are simply Hoffmannian icon interfaces for male or female gendered conscious agents. Of course, this contradicts the centered line given by gender ideology that gender is detachable from sex, and that the former is purely a social construct. But given that sex is an icon interface for gender, what then are we to make of claims that one has the wrong biological sex for their gender? What the hell do you think you're doing? I'm going to the potty. This is the girls' bathroom! Alright, I need to tell you something, Wendy. I'm transgender. What? Did you notice the bow? I'm not comfortable with the sex I was assigned at birth, so I'm exercising my right to identify with the gender of my choice. Now get out of my way, I have to take a shit. Ah. Here, some good old-fashioned Maasai common sense comes in handy. For a man, he has a penis. For a woman, he has a vagina. So we know this is a lady, this is a man. Can a man become a woman? No. No? No. What about a transgender? Okay. Transgender? No. No? It looks like to, if you want to become a lady but your man, you have something wrong in something your wrong. mind. Something wrong in your family, something wrong in you. What if it's a woman with a what if it's a woman with a penis? What? People are laughing. Is that, is that a dumb question? <laughs> in my country, I can't go a day without hearing it. We hear it every day. So in my country, sometimes you'll hear people say, a man will say I, that I'm a, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. And so they say that I have a woman trapped inside me. <laughs> Based on what I'm saying, would you ever want to move to America? <laughs> They say no, never. As demonstrated, the concepts discussed here are at odds with woke gender ideology. But how do we turn this into an effective means to push back against woke extremism? In my previous video, I discussed the twin pillars of Western civilization, as noted by 20th century political thinker Leo Strauss, that of Athens and Jerusalem, or reason and revelation. The modern rise in woke extremism is due to an imbalance between these. Many of our norms are influenced heavily by Jerusalem, by religion, but religion in the West is largely in decline. The reason why is easy enough to understand and has to do with its epistemology. Namely, it is based on revelation rather than reason, making it subjective to its adherence, and thus placing it at a structural disadvantage when influencing culture. Confining itself to epistemic subjectivity, it also reduces its sense of legitimacy in the public sphere. Thus, whenever reason is seen as conflicting with it, it will always be seen as on the losing side. Providing a framework on which it can ground its claims outside of itself can change this, though. In effect, the ideas produced by religion can be translated into something that is not religious at all, into something secular, and thus not merely subjective to religion. The ideas discussed here provide one way of doing that. The only remaining problem is in making them culturally relevant. Here, sociology becomes important. If one looks at Athens in its modern institutionalized form, academia, one quickly recognizes that though concepts coming from it can be used here, using it towards this end would be counterproductive. Modern academia has developed many dogmas of its own, perhaps being as easily influenced by the Ash and Milgram effects discussed in the previous video as modern religion. Many areas are open to question, but some things are almost cultishly sacrosanct when compared to the range of views held by the public at large. For example, the sort of idealistic framework used before would be almost an anathema to many academics, with some going so far as to warn that developments in modern physics should not be taken literally due to them entailing quote-unquote radical metaphysics if taken to be literally true. This is, is there a danger that we get pushed to what is called uh, idealism, in the sense that we think that the what the job of science is become is not looking at an objectively existing world and identifying true features of it, but simply the world exists in our perceptions of it. Oh, because uh, uh, quantum mechanics are already doing to some extent that. That's my. Yeah, I really want to push back against what you just said. I think only to get me to push back against exactly. it. Exactly. Uh, but but uh, the idea that that 
you know, there are things that exist, that, that we have these preconceptions about what exists, and now we have to find a physical theory that works with that. That's been extremely detrimental to scientific progress. Um, having preconceptions is a bad idea. The way that we've made progress is when we do experiments and then try to explain them and see where that leads us. Nobody, no philosopher in the whole universe would have ever dreamt up quantum mechanics. People would drag kicking and screaming to that. So on the one hand, by observations, by, observations, by, by, by measuring boring spectra of atoms that I personally don't care about at all. But that's the kind of thing that, that leads you to revolutionary progress. Mm -hmm. And then you have to follow that to the bitter end, wherever it leads you. Likewise, many in academia insist on taking the most ludicrous positions in regards to consciousness, be it literal magic in the form of strong emergence, or the outright denial of the existence of their own minds, all in favor of a pig-headed adherence to materialism. Meanwhile, this materialist framework filters down into sociology through the dialectical materialism of the very same neo-Marxist thinking that led to woke extremism in the first place. This has led to many campuses becoming breeding grounds for hordes of undead woke zombies. With such mindsets, it is in too many cases impossible for them to change their minds on such lunacy as gender ideology, or even to tolerate opinions to the contrary. When dealing with the undead, it may instead be helpful to adopt the containment strategy seen in some zombie movies. Here appeal to Western civilization's other pillar, Jerusalem, comes into play. Religion has been cut into retreat, largely due to not having an objective framework on the issue. A typical response from religion would be to appeal to the Bible. The only trouble, of course, is that this is not objective outside of religion. As such, it is necessary to reground Jerusalem with an objective framework, allowing religion to be thought about differently. The steps to doing this are relatively simple. First, it is necessary to establish physics-based idealism as a basic framework. Once this is done, it is merely a matter of drawing the relevant connections. First between physics-based idealism and esoteric metaphysics, and then between esoteric metaphysics and the subject matter of religion. This will allow for religion to be thought about differently, without the subjectivity associated with the Beelts dogma. Then when complaints that one is bigoted for not celebrating Mr. Broflovsky's choice to become a dolphin arise, one could politely explain that sex is a Hoffmannian icon interface for gender and that therefore, if one believes one has the opposite gender for one's sex, that, in the words of the Maasai people, You have something wrong. <laughs> Such a narrative might not be enough to unwoke SJW zombies. However, its mere existence could be enough to quarantine their influence behind a buffer. This is where the real relevant social force comes in, namely, the common man. The common man is influenced by both Athens and Jerusalem, by both academic concepts and religion. However, unlike the average academic, the common man does not adhere to academia's own irrational dogmas. For example, when presented with physics results that conflict with materialism, the average individual is more likely to adopt the simulation hypothesis, or some form of idealism, rather than to assert a form of instrumentalist science denialism to avoid quote-unquote radical metaphysics. Likewise, the person on the street is more likely to take the basic a priori facts concerning philosophy of mind at face value, then adopt the increasingly ridiculous views in the subject, popular among academics. Furthermore, it should also be noted that the average person does not share the taboo on esoteric topics found in academia. Quite to the contrary, the public tends to possess a fascination with such topics, eating the subject matter up like candy. This allows the opportunity to cause the average person to think about religious norms on the subject differently, such that it reaches parity with or supersedes woke gender rhetoric. If public opinion can be swayed like this, the woke extremism found in modern academia will still exist, but its social relevance will be greatly diminished in the wider culture. Lastly, the fact that this underlying structure undergirds the same picture in every major religion allows for a unique opportunity. The Adam and Eve story is specific only to some religions. However, one need not believe in that story to argue for the norms provided by religion around gender. For example, a Hindu might not believe in Adam and Eve, but instead believe in Shiva and Shakti. Likewise, a Muslim could argue for the same concept as found in Sufi principles. Similarly, a spiritual but not religious person could simply argue directly on grounds of the androgyne, as found in esoteric metaphysics. The same androgyne principle exists behind all of these. If this is realized, it could allow for a unified front to promote these shared values, stemming from a shared underlying framework 
that might perhaps be able to quarantine the woke mind virus and its extremist ideologies once and for all. If you like this video, subscribe and support me on Patreon. And don't forget to check out the books in my Alaris novel series, Alaris, The Lances of Light and Alaris, The Pearl of Heaven, on Amazon Kindle in the description below. You can find us on Facebook as well, at Idealism and Science vs. Atheism. As